Today, or last week, we walked through an overview of the Ephesians 4 gift ministries. The men and women that were given to the church as gifts to equip the church for ministry or service. Now, if you don't have any of the sheets, there's probably one around you. Take one. There's, if you need one, then raise your hand and we can get one to you. Um, but before we get in the nitty gritty of these gifts, the nitty gritty of these gifts, um, there are three additional points that I'd like to make, some of which were from questions people had last week, and some were just, I, I just want to share them. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the first point, is if you have a body of 30 or more people, like our church, most likely, yeah, 30 or more, <laughs> would he, most likely we would have a majority of these gift ministries within our congregation. However, not everyone is a gift ministry. These are different than the body gifts. Where everyone has a body gift, not everyone is a gift ministry of the church. You may not be, and if, that, and if you aren't, that is great. You just need to be who God's made you to be. Um, in fact, there may be very few of the, these gift ministries in the church, these equippers, or there, will be, there might be multiple of particular gifts, these gifted people within the church as well. So, that's the first point. The first point is you may not be one of these, but that's okay. It is really good, regardless of whether you're one of these, it is really great to understand who these people are and how they function within the church, regardless. The second point, okay, point two, is a caution, is that these gifted men and women may in fact be Christ's gift to the church, but they should not act like God's gift to the church. <laughs> you got it? Hey, that was playing words. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, so, so a defining characteristic of this, these men and women should be humility and service. And you notice that I am saying men and women. I'm not just saying women, and I'm not just saying men, because there is no gender qualification for these gifts within the church. These are gifted men and women God gives to the church. But humility and service must be what defines these people. Remember, these were the kinds of gifts that bred dissension and division among those in the Corinthian church. We studied about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2, 3, and onward. And one of the most common abuses within the church of these gifts are equipping leaders with three things. Ambition, power, longing for power and position, and getting inflated egos. So if you are one of these gifts to the church, Humility and service must be the attitude that you need to be like Jesus. You and I, we need to be like Jesus in how we live these gifts out. Because once you get the inflated ego, once you desire a position and a title or something like that, it gets distorted, abused, and it causes woundedness within the church instead of what it's supposed to encourage, which is unity and interdependence within the church. And then there's a second caution, or point three, is that we must not confuse giftedness with maturity and character. We must not confuse giftedness with maturity and character. Okay? 16 years ago, I was being coached in a church plant. It was our second church plant we were doing. A really great brother was coaching me. He said this, Gather your top eight or ten leaders, he told me, and then start investing in them, and then they can start investing in others. And that's not bad advice for a church with hundreds of people or thousands of people. But this was a fledgling church, an infant church, a slow growth, make disciples and multiply from the grounds up type of church. We barely had a dozen adults and our top leaders were like two people on a good day. Church planning teams are almost constantly bumping into problems or limitations 
the pressure of not enough. You don't have enough ministries. You don't have enough people. You don't have enough finances. You don't have enough outreach. You don't like. You don't have enough of nearly anything as a young church. And there's pressure not only from the culture, the church culture, the church planting culture, but even from one another. Even on myself as a church planter or the team I'm with, I put pressure on myself for these things as well. It's common to feel a constant, desperate desire for people to just come along and get something done within the church. So when a gifted person comes along who's willing and is competent and starts actually getting stuff done within the church, it's really easy to be enamored and just say, let's go for it together. But unless we also have a way of evaluating how mature these gifted people are, we're asking for trouble. Why? Because putting people into positions of leadership before their character can bear it is a recipe for disaster within the church. How many of us have either been involved in a church with a very gifted leader, but their character was deficient. So when they were tempted, they fell. And then there's, they sinned, and then there's carnage and woundedness within the body because of that character deficiency. It's easy to flock around gifted people in our culture because our culture elevates people just like they did in 1 Corinthians, like it's no different today. We elevate people to the point of celebrity. But unless you have the character to go along with that, it's a huge recipe for disaster within the church. One of the most devastating makes we can make as church leaders or leadership within a church is to assume that giftedness is the same thing as maturity. And if you'd like to go deeper into the five equippers, I'd like to recommend two books for you. Uh, in fact, most of the things I'm going to share come from me reading these books. Both of these guys are friends of mine. The first one is called Creating a Missional Culture by J.R. Woodward. J.R. was a church planning coach for me for a few years. He's a gifted apostolic leader within the country. He leads a church planting ministry. So the first book is called Creating a Missional Culture by J.R. Woodward. Amazing book. The second one is another brother I met maybe 10 years ago. His name is Alan Hirsch. And he wrote a book called The Forgotten Ways, where he deals with these five gifts. And both of these guys, the way they talk about these five gifts are profound and theological and uh, kind of born out in the crucible of ministry in life. So I'd recommend these. Now, before we jump in, I'm going to show you a video. This is my friend JR. He, from his book, uh, he gives an overview of these five gifts. So let's take a look. understand 
the craziness of the church. Uh, the prophet is uh, is really kind of connecting people directly to God because when you're in, when you encounter the prophet and the prophet's effects, you, you kind of like realize you, you just kind of connect straight to God. You feel like man, God is in our presence. And then the apostle is really kind of looking at the whole picture, and they're kind of concerned really about seeing the other Clippers live into their roles and all the other gifts live into their roles. So they're helping everybody live out the calling. But that's a, a, a like a picture of maybe how they interrelate. And uh, now maybe find out which one you think might be your primary or secondary ones and, and go to the video that will give you a picture of that. So we're going to start today with Apostle. How can we recognize an unhealthy Apostle? And what should we do about it if we discover there's an unhealthy apostle within our congregation? And before we talk about the immature apostles, let's talk about apostles. How are they Christ's gift to the church? Now, apostles are sent ones. Literally, that's what it means, sent ones. And here are some signs of an apostle in general. They have big ideas, a lot of big ideas. They don't give up easily. They see the frontier and they need to take new ground, like they're compelled to do it. They have a history of starting things, especially churches, ministries, and or businesses that advance the kingdom of God. They see opportunity everywhere they look. Everywhere they go, opportunity is raising its head. They tend to catalyze people to live into God's kingdom vision and they can easily envision how to build organizations and people. And I have several friends who are apostles over the years, a lot of friends, because that's kind of my circle of closest friends that over the years. And I am one. So that helps. And many of them have 17 new ideas before they eat breakfast every morning. Seriously, they do. I used to be like this. When our first church plant, I would drive the elders crazy. Because every week I'd have a whole blanket of new ideas, how we can reach people with the gospel, how we can plant churches, how we can multiply disciples. And I had a billion ideas. Was I good at doing any of them? Not really that great, but I was great on the idea front. They're always thinking about the next frontier, how to extend the kingdom of God into new places. And they, ne they network with leaders throughout their city, and even around the country and internationally. Like literally, I know church planters in most countries in the world. I have some sort of connection or relationship. I have uh, relationships with church planters in our city. I know church planters around the nation, and I know church planters around the world. And I'm connected somehow with them relationally in different ways. But before we get into the immature ones, all of you have sheets in front of you. And the sheets have a description of it. So I need someone who will read the first paragraph. Could someone just read it like loudly? An apostle, dream awakening, has the ability to vision, grasp, and communicate the overall picture of how God's kingdom purpose can be best further locally, regionally, and worldwide. They have a deep desire to see God's kingdom become more tangible in the world through the church and seek to network with other apostles or dream awakening and churches to this end. They are visionaries. Instigators, networkers, extenders, mentors, and equippers, coordinating and empowering the body of Christ to fulfill their kingdom purpose as their missionaries within their context globally. Globally. So, globally is not my word. That was come up with a guy, came up with him who's a pastor in Texas. Globally means both globally and locally, combined into one word. So, they always, apostolic or apostles, always are seeing. How to expand the kingdom locally, but they always have a view to the nations. Always have a view to expanding the frontiers of the church outwardly. You can kind of get a picture just from the first paragraph that, that Ryan read, that apostles are big picture type people. They see things, they see the whole picture of not only what's going on locally, but what's going on in the city, what's going on everywhere else. And the reason J.R. calls it Dream Awakener is because J.R., when he wrote his book, he was trying to say, if we were to call them something today, what would we call them in English, in our culture, in our country? 
Apostle was an actual frequently used word at the time of the New Testament authors. But he puts it dream awakers. Why? Because they awaken dreams in people of the grandness of the kingdom of God and how they can participate in that. In dream awaker, the dream awakeners, apostles, can often see gifts in people and call them out to live into those gifts. They might not even be fully aware of it. And one example in my life has been we were planting a church in Portland, and there's this guy, and I don't know how he didn't know this, but he was an evangelist. Like the guy always was concerned about how to communicate the gospel, how to build bridges between the church and the world. And everywhere he went, he goes, he's thinking about that. He's compelled relationships over here. He's friends with a whole bunch of Hindus, and he's connecting relationally with them, doing things with them, and then in that relationship, he's sharing the God. And like, literally all the time when I get together, I'm like, Who do you, what do you do this week? Oh, this week, I'm out with a whole bunch of Buddhists, and we had the most amazing time talking about Buddhism, and I got to share about Jesus with these people, and they were like, yeah, Jesus is a God. And there he was like, no, Jesus is God. <laughs> and, like, and he just goes off, and every time I talk to him, it's something like that. And so I was like, I just looked at him one day and I said, dude, you're an evangelist. And he goes, what do you mean? I go, well, let's look at what that means. And we looked at the scripture and he was like, oh my gosh, I am. And he's like, no one has ever told me that. And I said, well, this is how you, how you should, let's, so I started mentoring him and being involved in his life. And he and I still work together, actually, to this day. He is, when I said I do local animation for a living, he, I helped him start the local animation business. He shares the gospel with people all over the world through this. It's amazing, this guy. And But I remember him just, I said, this is how you should be used in the church. And I explained it to him. And he was like, you mean I'm supposed to impact other people so they live more into the gospel? It's like, yes. And you're also not supposed to judge people when, because they're not. And you're, you're there to help them in their journey of living deeper into the gospel, proclaiming it, living into it. And he was like, oh my gosh, I have a purpose. And, and I think even talking today, he'd say in that church plant, he felt the most empowered to be who God's made him to be than he ever has. Because he lived into being an evangelist. But that was just part of being an evangelist. Could someone read the second uh, paragraph there? Loudly? Oh, of the page on apostles. So you see a lot of discipleship type materials coming from apostolic leaders in the world and calling people into that, which for me, the way, the way I did that here was fight clubs, like creating something that helps people deal with what fight clubs are and why they exist. Fight clubs are a relational way to grow deeper into Christ and to challenge each other to do it. And that, that's one, now that's just, there's a million ways to do that, right? But that's part of creating a discipleship type of ethos within the church, calling people to live in to the big picture of God's kingdom. And apostles can often function in all the different gifts at different times. And that's, they're kind of multi-faceted, multi-hatted type people. Like this year I've lived less into the kingdom expansion part, but more into the pastoral teaching part the last year and a half. But I can guarantee you, like I'm always thinking about who are the equippers in our church. Like I'm always thinking about it. And I will talk to you about it. If I think you're one and I'm building a relationship with you, I'll probably say, I think you're this and call you into that. Or call you to explore that over different times. It's a, that's something I'm constantly aware of. And at some point I'd like to actually recognize teams of these type of gifts within the church. One of the downfalls of apostles 
is that apostles can often be pioneers, but they can leave people behind because they're so pioneer focused. But if you look at scripture, how many churches did Paul plant? Who knows? Five. A good guess, five? Seven. Seven. Two. Yes, nine. two, nine, good. Two, yes. 41? No, nothing. Okay. Zero. He planted zero churches. Dang it. There. It's a trick question. I tricked you all. <laughs> and he, every single church was planted by a team. Everyone. Paul was never by himself. He was never the planter. He always did it with apostolic teams with different people, even with different giftedness among them. Men and women are part of the teams. Some of them stayed behind. Some of them moved on with Paul. Like Paul and his disciple Timothy. Timothy was like little apostle apprentice going along with him everywhere. And then Titus was like him too. And then he'd say, hey guys, I don't really have time to go back to this church. Why don't I send you to go deal with the mess in Ephesus? You know, why don't I send you to go to Corinth and deal with that mess? I'm going to stay over here and advance the kingdom. And it was always apostolic teams that he dealt with. But in our culture, and especially in church planning culture, they always talk about finding the man, like the man who is the man with the plan. Who you know, I can think of another line, but I'm not that great. You know, but that's the idea. Like that's the way they talk about it. But that's not the way the scripture looks at it. The scripture looks at it from a point of apostolic teams of people going together from place to place. And, you, and if you're an apostle, you need other gifted people with you. Or you will only think, because you think through the lens of kingdom. That's how you process. You're always going to be pushing people to expand the kingdom, to live on mission, to expand the frontiers of the church. But you need some pastors in there to go, hey, we should care for the people too. You know, you need some evangelists to say, yeah, and they need actually someone to help them know how to share about Jesus with people. You need prophets in there to help people go, oh, we need to stay on course and connect with God on a deeper level. You need these different gifted people with you. Okay, there's that. So, um, last paragraph. Who will read that? Louder. talk about thing, movement from time to time. Like what if there was a movement and across the city of Colorado Springs where there was little pockets of the church in each neighborhood that lived on mission together. And they met and then there was enough of those within a neighborhood where they formed they had their own worship gathering within the neighborhood. You didn't have to drive 20 to 30 minutes. To worship 10 minutes to go to worship with other believers they were in your neighborhood and so when you had a sunday gathering your gospel community is like going i invited you to go down the street that's where we're meeting that's where we'll be i'm inviting you to join us that is the heart of grassroots down that's where we're headed big picture and that's why we sent michael to the east side you know with a team that then disintegrated and then rebuilt. <laughs> and, uh, but that's just part of the deal with being an apostolic leader. But you kind of get the picture of this here. 
if you're an apostle, you probably think in both creating systems and renewing the systems, but for a particular purpose, to expand the kingdom of God. You are passionate about it. When you wake up, you think, how can we have more impact for the kingdom of God as a church? Here's some examples here of different apostles. You can look it up in scripture, but here's a caution. That apostles can find their achieve, a value in achievement instead of in God, because we're so driven to expand the kingdom. And because of this, they can value mission at the expense of individual and community, which that's an issue, especially in a small church, especially. So now, what, hap what do you do if you have immature apostles within your church? How do you deal with it? Because apostles don't come from the factory mature and ready to lead. They just don't. Like the rest of us, they start out immature, and then their greatest strength is also their greatest weakness as well. Apostles struggle to focus on one idea instead of chasing down the new ones just because they're new. They often make hasty decisions in an effort to keep momentum, to keep moving forward. They have a hard time relaxing and just being with people when there's no agenda for that. Ooh, that's interesting. Oh, that's a vacuum. Thank you. So here's some signs of an immature <coughs> apostle. They can't discern between good ideas and God ideas. Between the constant flood of innovative thoughts and the ones that God is actually giving to them for the church. They jump around from one idea to the next idea, unable to stay focused on any one thing. Eventually, peeps, people stop following them because they don't want to give their time and energy to something that will probably change in a few weeks. Or on the apostles' whim. Which I, I have had people struggle that with, that with me in the past. I'm growing, though. But I know that's as common among all my friends that are apostles, too. They can't turn it off. They can't take a day off. Because they're so kingdom-focused, they're like, man, why should I take a day off? Like, Satan doesn't take a day off. I'm going to keep expanding the kingdom, fortress, you know, tear down the walls. Like, that's, that's something they're compelled to do. So they need other people to go, hey, dude, Sabbath is important. Rest is good. Like, brother, take a break. Sister, sit down, rest, enjoy life. They have trouble being a part of a group that they're not leading. I have a huge struggle with that. You know? Which is why when I turned over our gospel community to Trevor and to uh, Ryan and Hillary, when I was, the, no, not, actually not you, Ryan and Annalisa, when I turned it over to them, I said, me and Anna are going to watch the kids. And so what we did every week was watch kids while they led because I knew if I was there, I would probably want to lead the group badly. And I'd probably think I could do it better, too, than the people who are leading it. But I knew they needed to lead it, and they needed to learn to lead it. And if I was in the room, it would hinder the ability for them to learn to lead. They tend to get, have very little patience with needy people or those who just don't get on board. You know, why don't you commit? These people don't commit. I wish they were more committed. Like that's a constant thing that you hear from apostle type people. Because if they're on board and they want you to come with them, I struggle with that. Their projects tend to produce relational carnage sometimes. People often heal, feel hurt and used by an immature apostle. Now maybe one or two people that you know come to mind that struggle with these kind of things, both in the positive and in the negative. Chances are high that you've met an immature apostle. It might even be that you are an immature apostle. Now before I talk about what to do with an immature apostle, I want to outline two temptations that every church leader will feel when they encounter an immature apostle. The, the first, the temptation to use them, and secondly, the temptation to reject them. 
One of the strengths of apostles is that they have lots of energy, lots of ideas all the time, and they get stuff done. It's so tempting to conveniently ignore the evidence of immaturity in order to keep the productivity flowing, especially when we found a good way to motivate them to keep up the good work. This is the temptation to use immature apostles. Yeah, they're immature, but look how fast we're, grow we're growing now. We're going 100 miles an hour for the kingdom. We haven't crashed yet, and it's so fun to have some momentum. Finally. Eventually, we'll get around to maturity and health, but for the sake of the vision, maybe we should just ride this out a little longer. I can't tell you how many times I've thought it or heard it from other apostles. Bad idea. When we use an immature apostle to advance our agenda, we're behaving immaturely ourselves as leaders. If we submit to the temptation to use people, we'll never be able to bring the body to maturity like God desires. When you begin to see the harm that an immature apostle can do to the body of Christ, the second temptation appears to reject the immature apostle. Because it can feel like an easy, clean solution to simply marginalize the immature apostle because they're immature. Keep them out of leadership. Keep them out of the loop. Stop responding to all their emails about why we're not advancing the kingdom so much. Why we're not planting other churches. Give them less and less time until they finally get discouraged and then they leave the church. Ironically, this temptation is also a way of actually using immature apostles to advance our agenda as leaders, to keep the vision pure and unsullied by immaturity and rejecting them, not letting them be who they are. But our job as equippers in the church is not to get things done or to avoid conflict and messiness. Our job is to bring the church to unity and maturity, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So if we don't use them or don't reject them, what do we do if we find we have an immature apostle in our church? We disciple them. We mentor them. We coach them. We get people involved in their lives so that they become more mature, so character gets developed them, so they can be who God's made them to be to the church and they don't cause as much carnage as they do it. After all, this is what Jesus did with a really bunch of screwed up, immature apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers called his disciples. Like he invested in them. So how do we disciple immature apostles? In some ways, we disciple them like we disciple anybody else. We love them by offering an abundance of both grace and truth, because Jesus was full of grace and truth. But discipleship looks different for an apostle than it may for an evangelist, prophet, shepherd, or teacher. The grace and truth needs to take on a certain shape when we're mentoring them. So what does grace and truth look like to mentor an apostle? Here's what grace may look like in mentoring an apostle. Here's a few notes on bringing grace to them. Apostles need an environment where failure is okay. It's okay for them to take risks. It's okay for them to do the unexpected. Apostles need to know that they aren't just being pacified. Oh, we'll let you eventually, maybe someday, 20 years from now, maybe plan a church. If we have enough money, enough people, and enough, if, 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 just pacify them. But truly welcome apostles and release them to be who God's made them to be. Apostles need an environment where new ideas are not a threat to the existing way of doing things, which is why they leave a lot of churches. Apostles need a low control environment. Don't micromanage them. We shouldn't micromanage apostles. Apostles need a big vision atmosphere. They need to know that what they're involved with actually has significance in the kingdom of God. And apostles need real, honest, tough critique of their ideas. And yes, this actually does feel like grace to an apostle when you critique their ideas. Because they have a billion of them, they need someone to help rein that in to discern what are these are for our church and what aren't. 
Now here's some truth. How do we bring truth to an immature apostle? Apostles need to learn compassion. Challenge them to care for others as they lead. Apostles need a high accountability environment, especially when it comes to following through on their ideas. Apostles need to learn to wait for what the God idea in the midst of their sea of good ideas. Apostles need to learn to be patient and trust that God is working even when they're not. Apostles need to learn to be patient and trust God as they live into their kingdom calling. They need accountability to actually take a Sabbath. Apostles need to learn to disciple and develop people while they're working on their ideas and projects and out their ministries. Their tendency will be to use people to accomplish their goals rather than they use the project or ministry to develop people, which is the way it should be. Here's the discernment tool. If you think you're an apostle, here's a simple tool for helping you hone your vision and keep people at the center of this of the ministry. First, write down all the kingdom dreams and ideas that you have, all billion of them. Write them all down on a piece of paper or a book. And then, after you've done that, rank them in order of priority, which things seem to have the most importance and credibility and application to your particular church context. And then after you've written them down, ask these questions. They're all who questions. To who am I called? To what people group are you called? Your neighborhood, your church, a, a city, where are you called? To whom are you called? Secondly, who's going with me to do this? Whether it's a ministry or a church or a movement. Who is the person of peace that God's opened up? That is the person that God is not a Christian, but they are open to hearing the good news about Jesus. Who is the person of peace who's the, 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 the focus of hospitality in your neighborhood or city? Fourth, who are you discipling? Because you need to. You need to have apprentices if you're an apostle. And lastly, who are you holding accountable as well? Okay, so I have a video of this. Can you show the video of an apostle? This is JR and his thoughts. Let's take a look at what the apostle uh, does. Um, first of all, if, if you're an apostle, you have a real passion to help people discover and live out their calling in life. And so you're, you're, you're really good at kind of doing that. Um, you also desire to cultivate a discipleship ethos because, uh, because your passion really is to see God's kingdom become a greater reality. And because that, that's your passion, you want to see the multiplication of disciples, the multiplication of small groups, mid-sized groups, churches, and even movements. And in order to see that happen, you really want to see that done according to how people are shaped, what their spiritual gifts are, what their hearts are, what their abilities are, their personality, and their experience. So the, the apostle really is concerned about all those things, helping both individuals and communities discover them and then live it out. Because they, as, as people discover the calling and live it out, they tend to multiply disciples. And uh, that's that's really what an apostle is uh, passionate about. And so if you're an apostle, uh, or if, it, if you're a budding apostle, you're going to be really concerned about uh, starting new things, multiplying disciples, multiplying That's impossible. So, before we move on to evangelists, and we might not move on to evangelists, um, <laughs> probably not. Up to this point, just what questions do you guys have about what we went through last week on the fivefold, the fivefold ministry of gift ministries, equippers, or the apostle gift? Any question you have?
How do you grow as an apostle? Very good. Very good question. If you're an apostle, probably the first thing you need to do is try to connect with people who are both like you, other apostles who are more mature than you are, perhaps. And secondly, connect relationally with people who are not like you. So that they can balance that kingdom thrust in you to help you see that there is more to the church than just starting new ministries, churches, and movements in the world. That's one of the ways. Secondly, the same way anyone else, like me, anyone else to grow, I, I'd say, if you, want to, you, if you want to grow in being an apostle, you study who were the apostles in the New Testament, how did they function within the church, talk to other apostles and in the city or even within your church and say, how do we typically function in church? How should we function within the body of Christ? But that's If you want to go specifically in that, that's probably how to, the beginning of how to do it. Yes? What if somebody thinks that they're none of these things, that they're none of these? Good people. question. That's great. And yeah, the very, actually that's the very first point was, if you're not one of these, then you're being equipped by those who are. And that's fine. In fact, here, here's what I want to avoid in the church, is creating an elite class of, of people who have, are given to the gift of church, gifts of church to equip them and setting them up on their own pedestal as if they're greater than the rest of the body. They're not. They're just like you. They just have been gifted differently than you. So if you're not one of these, pay attention to who are because they exist within the body. To, that's my two minute warning. Um, <laughs> they exist within the body to help you be more effective at serving, which is ministry. So that's their entire purpose. If an apostle, prophet, gift, pastor, teacher, evangelist is here, they exist within your church so that you would become more effective at serving. So pay attention to who they are and how they impact you when you're around them. You know? And, and like we, I talked about a little bit about last week about evangelists, so I'll talk about it from a, an ap a apostle perspective. I'm an apostle, so if, if I share big picture stuff, you'll probably feel some sort of compulsion to be involved somehow in big picture kingdom stuff. If you're the more you're around me, the more you'll hear me talk about that kind of stuff, especially if I'm healthy. Physically, I talk, I think about it all the time. Now, here's the, is you can take that two ways. One is you could go, man, I feel guilty because I'm not like him and I don't feel the exact, like that's one thing that actually you might feel because of being around the possible people. You might feel like, because let's say now, let's say you're, you're a different one of these gifts. You're a pastor. I, my existence within the church would threaten your existence. You could feel very threatened by me because if you're a pastor, you care about molding and shaping and caring for the flock. Every person becomes mature in Christ, God, spiritual tra transformation, formation track, man. And when you hear someone like me talk about kingdom, you're like, I feel like he's off, but I'm not off. I'm just being who God's made me to be. We need the other gifts to balance me so that we work together, so that you both hear the kingdom and the care. You hear we need to be outward and we need to be taught, like all, and we need to be connected to God so that we all exist and we're, that, anyways. And then, so when, if you're not one of these gifts, learn to recognize who these people are within the church and let them influence you in a healthy way to follow Jesus more wholly, more big, you know, more holistically. Does that make sense? We're not better than you. We just have a different purpose. That's it. Yes. Oh, I thought I had a question. Someone had a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
hearing him kind of broke behind the talk about not being one of these people. Um, and things. So like as a church, we're all getting as a gift to Christ, right? We're a gift God saved us, we're a gift as Christ to the Son. So there's a sense that corporately, yes. Yeah, corporate, there's a sense that we all are gifts to the Son. And there's a sense that you're talking about the divisions that are gifted as gift ministries to the church. Um, you know, the, the, it, does, it does seem that there would be a, a real easy, um, it would be very easy for, there, and you've seen it where there's this, this elevation of, of people um, from the others. So every church that I've come from in the past is an apostolic gift, and in life it's not taught in a lot of circles. It's seen as something that died with disciples and the apostles themselves. So how would you, this is the first thing I'm saying to Randy, this is the actual question. How, I know a brother who I would consider to be an apostle, he's never been taught what that means, he feels lost within the church, what do you do? You help them connect to the church, because if they feel lost, it's because one, and like I've talked about, the three, three of these gifts that are most Neglected within the church are apostle, prophet, evangelist, for the most part. You know? what, the, what the church in America really values is pastor and teacher. So that's a lot of times who is kind of shepherding, pastoring, eldering the church, whatever, how you say that. Not that, and so apostles often, if they're in a church, they feel the itch. An immature apostle who is immature, uh, will probably say I will remain disconnected. I will, I'm not, they find their value from what they do instead of from how God's gifted them to the church. So they they find their value in going and pioneering something new and they need to see that their value is not in the pioneering. Their value is in the equipping. And they've missed it. They've missed the whole point of being an apostle, which is equipping the church for service. And part of that is the bigger kingdom purpose of the church involving the expansion of church. And so if they're an apostle and they're lost, first thing they need is to get back involved and connected to a body meaningfully. Second thing they need to do is they probably need to heal if they've been neglected or hurt or wounded. They need to go through some healing. Thirdly, they need to be connected with somebody who's going to invest in their life to help them become used, not used as a project, but used in their gifting within the church. Again, uh, instead of being kicked out or sent out to do something else. And that is the, uh, an issue with apostles because they have such impulse to move out. Like, I think about it so much, but I, the more I become, the more I am mature as a believer, the more I actually see I'm an apostle, but I need to stay put right where I'm at for now. I need to be here for the sake of the church. And other apostles like me need to stay put too until God raises up a team to send out. So I think that's how I'd handle it. But then if they can only, the problem is going to be they might be so fine, have their value so wrapped in starting something new that they can't think outside that lens to see the bigger picture that they need other people. And they actually need the other gifts. And that's going to be a constant thing for apostles. So when you tell them, hey, brother, you need, or sister, you need to actually be a part of this, of a community, and you need to heal, their gut response is going to be, but that's not who I am. I just don't feel comfortable in the church. Well, let me give you, the only, the only one of these, five, probably two of these five gifts probably feel comfortable within the church. Pastors feel comfortable in the church because they love caring about people. They just love it. Teachers feel comfortable in the church because where there's people who want to be taught, they can't wait to teach them. And so they're like, man, I can't wait. The three that are going to be feel not at home within the church are those apostle, prophet, and evangelist. And those are the three that we need desperately, probably the most in the church in America. Okay, good question. Any other questions?
Well, when, yeah, when you're a pioneer, you kind of wear all the hats in a sense. But, but it's, for me, I feel like only it's been, uh, I've desperately desired a team more than anything. But I can function in those different gifts at different times. So, and I probably will when there's not other people who either are stepping into those roles. Um, but I'm, I'm not, my first gut response as an apostle is not to be a prophet. Like it's only like if God, it's like, oh, the church needs to hear this, so you need to redirect. Like that's where I'll function more in that role. That hadn't really happened in this church so, um, so much. So uh, the apostle needs to be involved in, with people in each of those gifts. And my goal, or any other apostle's goal, would be to help that person blossom and bloom in that. And that way, I don't need to function in that. I don't. I don't need to be that to the church. Um, but for times, many times, apostles do end up functioning in different roles. I don't, I, did I answer your question or not? We are developers. If I see those gifts, I want to develop them. I want to see them because I so long for them to be who God's called them to be in the church and not leave and go somewhere else, you know, to, to start some other ministry. Yeah. It seems like you're saying that the, as an apostle, you see a gap filled with, with desire to apply some Yeah, but someone who's gifted. Yeah. You're not just anybody. Not anybody but yeah. Since you call the gifts out of the people, you yeah. see the gifts the people, you see the person who's out of the people. Right. Yes. Yeah. What what passion? Where it comes. Yes, that's true. And and the hardest one for me over the years of all of them has been prophets. Uh, one because prophets are in most churches they say prophets don't exist. A lot of them do. Not a, I mean charismatic circles are way exist. You know that. You know that. Uh, but in non charismatic circles, it's like they don't really exist. And so pro so when I have a prophet in a church, they have. It's the hardest one for me. Not, not for me to develop, but it's the, they have the hardest time staying a part of the church. Because they see the things that need to grow in the church. They want people to connect with God, so they want it now. Like now. They don't see that. You know, a lot of times when you have prophets in the Bible, which we'll get to this, they give prophecies. When they give a prophecy, it's like a mountain range. They can see that there's a prophecy, but they're only seeing the tip of the mountain. And the prophecy is really 2,000 years away when it's going to be. But in their mind, they see it like it's happening tomorrow. And it should happen tomorrow. Why doesn't the church change? And, you know, that's, and so then they're like, get frustrated with the church. They don't feel like they have a place. And then they leave. And then some of them go hyper-charismatic on you and go like, you know, if everyone doesn't like speak in tongues and stuff, then they're not like from God. And, and, and then it's like everyone gets wounded. And then they leave. You know, both times they leave. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, so it's hard. It's harder with prophets in our culture. That's harder. In other cultures, it's not so hard. In some sense, sense. Okay, we're out of time. Yeah. So we did, we did not get to evangelists. I knew we. I, it's a five-person. Five uh, hopefully not. But, um, 